Well, my beloved brothers and sisters, and all the friends and visitors, I praise the Lord for this unique opportunity which we have to worship the Lord on this Holy Sabbath day. And why do I say unique opportunity? Because I believe that every Sabbath is a unique opportunity. Because the Lord has especially made this time, this period of time for our uh, close relationship with Him. You know, the Word of God tells us that God created everything in six days. But then He did not stop there. It's interesting. The Word of God then further says that and on the seventh day the Lord finished all His work. When He created everything in six days, then the Lord thought, well, I have to do something else. I have to create one more space of time for human beings, for men whom I have created, so that He can rest on this day, He can sanctify this day, and He can have a close relationship with me. And that is the most wonderful thing. So every Sabbath is truly a manifestation of love of God towards us. And so this is a day also of rejoicing. It's a day of worshiping the Lord. It's a day of studying His Word. A day of fellowship and a day of rejoicing. So I praise the Lord for this, my dear brothers and sisters. And first I wish to bring you greetings from... Uh, Australia, as it has been announced. This is the country where I live. And also from brethren in Korea. I've just visited them there. From um, um, China. That's where I went also. And from Vietnam. Um, I have already related some experiences here on Wednesday night. But if opportunity arises today, perhaps I could tell you some more. The Lord is doing my marvelous work today. And um, He calls upon us to proclaim this wonderful message which He has given us. A message of salvation. You know, when I arrived here in Ronog, I observed the trees. The beautiful nature. And I saw this, this I don't know whether they are flower, uh, fruit trees or just flowering trees, but they all were budding the, the flowers are just starting to show color but they were still closed they were in the bud and now a week later they're all open and very beautiful did you observe the lovely trees young trees around here and it inspired me to think about this uh, parable that Jesus has spoken which has been read in Matthew chapter 24 that, that uh, parable was a response of Jesus to his disciples. Because if we read in the beginning of the chapter, in verse 3, chapter 24, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples come unto him privately, saying, We read very often the disciples come to Jesus in private. Because Jesus was very, very busy. Very busy man, if you like. And the disciples had not much opportunity to speak with Christ in private. Things that concerned them. Things that they wanted to explain. Something in a very close circle, as it were. And so that he, that he could speak to them personally. And this is something also that we should learn ourselves. With our busy schedule of life, we should spend time with Jesus in private, isn't it? This is the best for us. Now, when then they, they expressed to him their concern. And they asked Jesus, when will all these things be? He says, and it says, as, as, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? 
And what shall be the sign of thy coming? Of course, the disciples, they hoped that Jesus would then establish the kingdom, overthrow the Roman power, and free them from this burden of oppression. <clears throat> But then they did understand that Jesus will come again. And they were hoping that this will be in their lifetime very quickly, very soon. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So Jesus told them very clearly, as you read the chapter 24, you will read. You will find that I advise everyone to study this chapter very carefully, very closely. Perhaps we will find in that chapter that Jesus spoke of our time that is to be fulfilled almost 2,000 years later. But then he, he gave this parable and saying that uh, when you see, <coughs> he spoke of a fig tree, of course he used fig tree, but any tree for that matter. When you see his bench yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. In Australia, we do not have this, this definite season. <laughs> we have more or less uh, uh, what they call rainy season and, and uh, dry season. Perhaps those brethren who come from Brazil, you might have the same. But in this northern hemisphere, you have these definite seasons. So likewise, when ye see, when ye shall see these things, know that the, it is near even at the doors. Very last time to you, this, general, this is very important to understand this text, brothers and sisters. Very last say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. Which generation is this? Is that the generation that lived in time of Christ? Or is it generation that things are being fulfilled? Perhaps our generation. It says, this generation shall not, be, shall not pass till all things will be fulfilled. And then the Lord gives assurance, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. <clears throat> now, brothers and sisters, I do not need to elaborate much on the signs of Christ's second coming. We all are witnessing this all over the world. I wish to speak today on the warning and salvation message as it is presented in Revelation 18, 1 to 4. I'm not going to speak on the theological aspects of Revelation 18, because there are many interpretations, whether it has happened in the past, whether it's happening presently, or whether it is going to happen in future. But what I shall speak, what Revelation 18 is telling us, this is important. <clears throat> First, I believe that in Revelation 18, 1 to 4, and let us better read first those texts, and then we will look at them more closely. Revelation 18, 1 to 4. If someone would like to read to say my voice. Uh, yes, sister. Thank you very much, Sister Matero. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye, may, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. If 
we carefully analyze and give careful attention to the text or to the message of these verses in the intention of what the word of God wants to tell us here we will find here five points very important or should I say six we will find the signs of Christ's second coming in other words the events or what is happening in the world today Not only in the world at large, but in the Christian world as well. These texts tell us that the world is in a fallen condition. That the churches are in fallen condition. In a confused condition. Another thought that is brought here is a call for separation. I'm not going in, uh, in text uh, uh, in, in its order, but I'm just bringing out the thoughts that are in these texts. A call for separation, Se calling God's people to separate from the condition, from situation, from fall that is happening in the world and in the churches. In this text, we also call, see, for a reformation of those who are God's people, to be reformers. It also calls for an individual conversion, that God's people, as individuals, need to be converted. It also speaks of the glory of the glory of God the message the glorious message that God has given to his people and that this glory should be accepted by God's people and also speaks of God's people or duty of those who have this glory to proclaim it throughout the world six points here brothers and sisters And now let us have a look at those points. First, the condition of the world. Because in text 3 and 4 it speaks that Babylon is fallen. Is fallen. And what's happening to Babylon? Has become habitation of devils and holes of every foul spirit and cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And then it speaks how the nations are all involved. Now we know very well <clears throat> that Babylon denotes confusion. We know the origin of that word Babylon in the Tower of Bible when the languages were confused. <coughs> so the world today is in a very uh, sorry state, my brothers and sisters. Jesus said that there will be signs in earth or earth. And this generation will not pass, they will witness these signs. Now what are some of the signs that are happening today in the world? What are the signs, my brothers and sisters? Well, I will tell you just a few signs here. The uh, students of prophecy, I believe most of us are here who are present here, will know the signs that have already happened. These signs are, of course, uh, in Matthew 24. The major, I put here, 11 major signs that have already happened. Um, the Lord spoke of, of false Christs and false prophets, false teachings, heresies. The Lord spoke of wars. You know, the First World War was, and when the war ended, it was called the war to what? And all. all wars. Did that war end all wars? The Second World War was much worse than the First. And since the First World War, the Second World War, I should say, there were regional wars. 
that millions of people have died and are still dying. Put, uh, that more people have died in regional wars than combined in two world wars. This has been fulfilled, and it's been fulfilling. Now, famines. This century alone, more people have died of hunger than two, during two Second World Wars. During two World Wars, more people have died of hunger. Oh yes, pestilences. Jesus said there will be pestilences. I've already mentioned here, mentioned many places. <clears throat> Sometimes I read medical journals because my children are in this profession. The World Health Organization says that there are today more than 100 million people infested with AIDS. More than 100 million people! Think of this, my brothers and sisters. This is a pestilence. Such terrible pestilence. And they tell, in, the, in these magazines where I read, they tell us that this virus is one of the most fragile, the most weakest viruses of all than outside human body. You can kill this virus with washing detergent. You know, this dishwashing detergent? You just put in there a few drops of worship detergent, that virus, it will be destroyed. So weak it is. But once it enters human body, it is the most powerful, most devastating thing, most horrible that human beings throughout history has ever witnessed. And medical science has not found cure yet. Why? Because that virus affects what? The immune system. There are cells what are known as T cells that look in a shape of T, letter T, and they, that virus goes to those cells. But this way we can have also a spiritual lesson in this. That's what the devil does, doesn't he? He wants to destroy our what? Our spiritual immune system. Once he destroys that, he's got us. And this is what this virus does. So pestilences, my brothers and sisters, earthquakes and all others, pursuits of pleasure. But the, 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 the sort of more later signs we have, exploding world populations, nuclear weapons. I just heard the other day that the United States is now going to make uh, a smaller nuclear weapons that they can use where? Everywhere they want. Any nation that is threatening the United States, they will use it. They will have no, two, no second thought about it. And brothers and sisters, this is a dangerous thing. But of course, it's not only the United States that is thinking about this. All other nations are thinking the same. Marriage breakdowns. You know, the two, two institutions which the Lord has made in very in paradise, uh, the devil is attacking most. And that is the Sabbath and the marriage institution. <clears throat> Natural desire, disasters and violences. So all these things are conditions today in the world. Now, what are the messages, this message giving us? Are calls for separation, my dear brothers and sisters. First four of Revelation 18, what does it say? Come out, who? Who is to be separate? Of it, my people. God's people, yes. God's people are to be separate from confusion, from the conditions that are in, in the world and in Babylon, and not to be involved in any way. My brothers and sisters, not to be partakers. Why? Why not be partakers? Come out of here, my people, that ye be not partakers of your sins, and that ye receive not what? Of her plagues. Because it's very dangerous. When someone has a contagious disease, 
and you are very closely associating with that person, you will, you can receive that disease. This is why the call for separation. God's people are to be separate, my dear brothers and sisters. <clears throat> we as individuals and as a church. I wish to read a, a statement from Spirit of Prophecy. It says this way. The world must not be introduced into the church and married to the church. Which is the church. The church of God, isn't it? Through union with the world, the church will become corrupt. A cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The customs of the world must not have a place in the church. <coughs> for, they will be, for they will open doors through which the prince of darkness will find access. So the customs of the world, my dear brothers and sisters, sometimes customs of the world seem so harmless. But then the door must be shut. So the church must be preserved from the influences and customs of the world. It's a message of separation. <clears throat> the church is in the world. It is to do our work for, for the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the doors of the church are not to be opened to worldliness. Just, can you bring me a bit of water? <coughs> you shouldn't have a cold. Now my throat gets a bit... Dry. <clears throat> Why? Because it says here, the world is the chief enemy of religion. Chief enemy of spirituality. The satanic forces are constantly at work through the world. And those who are professed Christians, <coughs> yet associated with the world, in close fellowship, are so much one in spirit, aims, and principles of, and of workings that they cannot discern between him that served God and him that served the world. So a message of separate. When is it? Is this something for the future? Or it was in the past? It's today, my dear brothers and sisters. Today is the message for us who live today. It was the message also for those who lived in the past. It will be a message for those who will come after us. But hopefully the Lord will come. Because it says this, gener this generation will not pass till these things be fulfilled. Well, thank you, my brother. So a message of separation. Separation from the world, separation for, from confusion. And it's today. <clears throat> Be ye separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Apostle John puts it even more explicitly. <clears throat> what does he say? Apostle John says, love not the world. We are not to. <laughs> that's, that seems a, a paradox. But the word of God says, For God so loved whom? The world. That he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, Apostle John says, Love not the world. What does it mean? Yes, brother. Two different ideas. Two different ideas, exactly. Love not the things of the world, the sins of the world. Now let us read what it says in, in, in 2 John. <clears throat> um, chapter 2, 15 and 16 says this way. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. So what is in the world? Last of the flesh. Brothers and sisters, I need not make big comments on that. Everything in the world today is depicting last of the flesh. Even the advertisements of, of products, or even of food, everything you use, 
is depicting this. The world is in total corrupt condition. Last of the flesh has to do with desire. The longing of humanity sensual nature. The law of passion says here, in spirit of prophecy, Adventist Psalm 127, the law of passion have their seat in the body and work through it. The words flesh and fleshly or carnal lusts embrace the law of corrupt nature. The flesh of itself cannot act contrary to the will of God. We are commanded to crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts. How shall we do it? Shall we inflict pain to the body? No. But put to death the temptation to sin. In other words, we are not to yield to temptation. <clears throat> the corrupt thought is to be expelled immediately. The corrupt thought to be expelled immediately. Every thought is to be brought into captivity to Jesus. So this is something, my brothers and sisters, a separation from the world or not loving the world, not loving things that are corrupt in the world. But we are to love the world in order to save them, as Jesus loved them. But we are not to participate in their, in their uh, 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 activities of, of sin. Then Apostle John says, last of the eyes. What are the last of the eyes? A reference to mental pleasure stimulated through sight. You know, many people tell me, as I travel around, Ah, oh, the reform, you, the reform, you. You are too restrictive. <clears throat> you are too forbidding. You are making man made laws. Well, I ask them, what is it? What are they? Well, you know, TV, um, magazines, movies, etc., etc. What's wrong with that? Many who do not participate in open sin, but are enjoy reading, seeing, studying pictures, and watching those things that feed the mind. And these are the medium through which the, the, the enemy of souls is working most successfully. <laughs> this is why the warning, my dear brothers and sisters, it's not a matter of, of forbidding, it's a matter of warning. And uh, with a loud voice warning, as it were. Uh, uh, David says in Psalm 101, verse 3, <clears throat> I will set no wicked thing where? Before, before my eyes. <clears throat> I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that are, <coughs> of them that are side, and it shall not cleave to me. And when we see those things that are in the world, and watching those things that are in the world, we are definitely setting, the, the, what does it say, setting wicked things before our eyes. And we as God's people, my brothers and sisters, are not to do that. So separation, can you see? And it says here in the Spirit of Prophecy, Exodus Apostles 5.18, <clears throat> those who would not fall prey to Satan's devices, <coughs> And we do not want to pray, fall prey to Satan's devices, my brothers and sisters. Who wants to do it? Who wants to pray, fall to Satan's devices? My put hand up. No, none of us. What should they do? They must guard well the avenues of the soul. We must guard well what the avenues of the soul. What are the avenues of the soul? Must avoid what? Reading. Young people, all actually, all are affected by that. The world is flooded with books. And not books that are really beneficial for our spiritual well-being. We must avoid reading, seeing, and hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. Oh, but just about everything that the world produces today. Not exactly everything, but most of it. Is, is suggesting impure thoughts. And we have to be very careful, my brothers and sisters. Unless we hold on to the Lord, unless we look to Jesus, we shall be swept away. We sh 
<laughs> but since so so gradually that we will not notice it. Once it we notice it's too late. It's like some diseases, some cancers. You don't know you have it when it's discovered that it's too late. So we must avoid reading, seeing, and hearing the, that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls might suggest. The heart must be faithfully sentineled. What's this word sentineled? Guarded. Guarded. Yes, thank you, sister. The heart must be guarded. Our inward thoughts, our inward heart, as it were, our inward, inward man, as Apostle Paul calls it, must be guarded. For evils without will awaken evils within, and the soul will wander in darkness. Oh yes, this is the message which brings warning of message in the Revelation 18, my dear brothers and sisters. <clears throat> then he speaks of reformation. People might say, what, where do you see reformation? Where do you see reformation in these in this texts? Oh yes, let's read verse 1. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice. What is this great power? <clears throat> well, I shall not go in very much detail. But this great power in original means authority. This angel has authority. Some interpret it as great power, multitudes of people, media, the wealth of money, and so on and so, on and so forth. But the great power in original language means authority. The same authority that Jesus had. What was the authority of Jesus? His life. His life. Let's read here. In Matthew 7, 29 it says, For he taught one, uh, taught them as one having authority. Jesus had no schools of Pharisees. He had no degrees of, of great, from great scholars in his time. But then they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as scribes. Or the, not as educated people of his day. And we would say today, to, to apply to our time, he taught them as the one, as the one having authority, and not as doctors of theology. Would we say that? Christ taught them. What was the authority? The words of Christ, those calmly spoken, were uttered with an earnestness and power that stirred the hearts of people. They were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, not as scribes. The Pharisees noted the vast difference between their manner of instruction and that of Christ. They saw that the majesty and purity and beauty of the truth, with its deep and gentle influence, was taking firm hold upon many minds. This is the way, my dear brothers and sisters, we have to proclaim the message and the warning. Yes, <clears throat> a message of awakening. Savior's love and tenderness drew the hearts of men to him. So this is great power that this angel has, that these people have, this great authority. Another a Greek word, a force, means force. A gospel is a power. Where do we find it? Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, what does it say? For I am not ashamed of what? Of the gospel of Christ. For what is the gospel of Christ? A power, power of salvation. Yes, this angel or these people who proclaim this message have this gospel, this power, this authority. The gospel of the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ is the only antidote of sin. The only antidote of sin, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, and people I know in Australia, there are many snakes. 
you in Brazil there are many snakes also, but there are very some most poisonous snakes in Australia. And when someone gets bitten by a snake, unless he gets this help, this antidote, as it were, within very short time, 20 minutes or half an hour, he will die most agonizing, agonizing death. Now, if we do not get the antidote, the gospel of Jesus Christ, this can happen to us. Because that's the only antidote. There's no other. As Christ's witnesses, we are to bear testimony of its power. What does it mean, this? What I just read. <laughs> As I read again, the gospel is the only antidote for sin. As Christ's witnesses, we are to bear testimony of its power. In other words, this antidote <coughs> we are, it has to be applied to us, isn't it? Antidote against sin. We are to bring the afflicted ones to the Savior. He is transforming grace. A miracle working power will win many souls to truth. <coughs> How wonderful. So this is the power that this angel has, my dear brothers and sisters. The authority of the life of Jesus Christ. This power of, of, of the gospel, of pure gospel, not mixed with men's ideas. And another, another phase of this power is but the power of the Holy Spirit. And we know what it, what it says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord. As a divine endowment, the power of the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples, so it will today be given to those, to all those who seek a right. This power alone is able to make us wise unto salvation and to fit us for the courts above. Christ wants to give us a blessing that will make us holy. Now, many people do not accept this. I, I probably mentioned here before, many years ago, I met a very fine lady who was a, a very noble lady also. She was a wealthy lady. She was helping many poor people. And I happened to go to this poor sister that we had in one city in Australia. And this lady told me, well, you in the reform, you teach perfection. And I cannot go along with that. We cannot be perfect. And I told her that we ourselves, of ourselves, do not teach it. The Word of God is teaching it. Because this is what Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as the Father which is in heaven is perfect. And we have here, it says, what does it say here? Christ wants to give us a blessing that will make us holy. God's people are to be holy, my dear brothers and sisters. You cannot have a more direct, slight word, isn't it? These things have I spoken unto you, he says. Jesus says that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be filled. The joy in the Holy Spirit is health-giving. The joy in the Holy Spirit is health-giving, life-giving joy. In giving us his Spirit, God himself gives us himself making himself a fountain of divine influence to give health and life to the world. And then the text tells us, <coughs> uh, let's go back to Revelation 18, it says, and he cried mightily with a lot of yes. Um, uh, I saw another angel, and he had a great glory. The world was lighted with his glory. So let us now just dwell a little bit on the glory and then the lightening of the world. The glory, what is this glory? <clears throat> so the followers of Christ are to, be, to shed the light into the darkness of the world. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is, to, is a light. As we know in many evidences in the word of God, God God's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of receiver. What will happen to us if we fully receive the Word of God? We shall be transformed, my dear brothers and sisters. Oh yes. Transformed in what? We shall have transformation of our lives, and our characters, in the character and life of Jesus. Another statement says the goal of a Christian is what? Christ-likeness. My dear brothers and sisters, 
we know that it is impossible with our own strength to have this character of Christ in our lives or to be Christ-like in our lives and our characters. But through this power, divine power, yes, it's possible. So it says here, <clears throat> through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver by implanting in their hearts the principles of his word. So we are to have principles of the word of God where? On our lips, outwardly, in our hearts. In our hearts, inwardly. Um, the Holy Spirit develops in man the attributes of God. The light of His glory. What is the light of His glory? His character is to shine forth in His followers. This is something, dear brothers and sisters, that we have to question ourselves. Are we experienced this yet? I myself have to question. Am I experiencing? Is the character, or is the light of His glory, His character shining in my life? We as individuals have to ask ourselves. Am I Christ-like in my attitude? in my love towards people, in warning the people, in helping the people, in, in pointing them to Christ, in desiring every soul, every person that walks upon this earth is to be warned. I have just mentioned that I was in Vietnam. In Vietnam people are very poor, they have no cars or very few cars. But they all have motorbikes or bicycles, small motorbikes. And in the morning, and the Vietnam is so small country, small lane mass, but so overpopulated that in the city where I stayed, in Ho Chi Minh City, or as it was known as Saigon, in the morning, you see thousands of people on the motorbikes. Streets are full of people. And traffic jams, just like you have on here, even cars. Like I saw in Korea, uh, these big, huge highways, and you just crawl, you know, uh, you cannot move. So are people on motorbikes. And I watched these people, and I was thinking, no, these people have to hear this wonderful message. What shall I do? Lord, make it possible for me, for every one of us, to tell these people, tell the world. Because the message must go to every king, kindred, tongue, and nation, and people. Everyone must hear this message, my dear brothers and sisters. So, but only we can do that by the divine power. But first, we ourselves have to have this. The light of his glory, his character, is to shine forth in his followers. Thus, they are to glorify God, to lighten the path to the bridegroom's home, to the city of God to the marriage supper of the Lamb. <clears throat> the world can only be warned by how? By seeing those who believe the truth, sanctified through the truth, acting upon high and holy principles, showing in a high elevated sense the line of demarcation between those who keep the commandments of God and those who trample them under their feet. That's in 7 BC, 980. So a message of reformation here in this text, my dear brothers and sisters. The light of the glory. And this glory is to proclaim throughout the world. We are to be overcomers. What are we to overcome, my dear brothers and sisters? What is the great sin? Yes, thank you, brother. Sin, selfishness. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. And it's through selfishness that sin came into the world, isn't it? The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. Steps to Christ 43. So the greatest, the power of, of a Christian is where? In submission. Just the opposite to the world. When we submit to Christ. Then we receive divine power and transformation can take place, my dear sisters. Such a wonderful transformation to be like Jesus. 
There's a song I've been singing in Australia. I don't know whether you have it here. Uh, to be like Jesus is my song. Something to that effect. How to be Christ-like. This is a theme which we should constantly have in, upon our mind. And it only can happen as we submit, as we recognize ourselves as nothing. Our pride goes into dust. <clears throat> now, my dear brothers and sisters, and the last point here is, which I wish, to proclaim this message to all the world. Oh, yes. We have to tell the world that Christ can save all. It's possible for all. Tell the world of, of, of salvation. We are not to delay for one moment. It's by His, not by, by our power, not by our strength, but by His might, by His strength. This glory is to go throughout the world. The earth is to be filled with the glory of the Lord, the Bible says. <coughs> and who is going to do this? Who is going to do this? I will read, still better to read. We have even heard out August 18, 1885. The third angel's message must go over the land and awaken the people and call their attention to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Another angel unites his voice with the third angel and the earth is lighted with his glory. The light increases and it shines out to all nations of the earth. It is to go forth as a light that burneth. Now remember this. As a light that burneth. It is not extinguished until it accomplishes its work. This is a prophecy. And you know when you have this Olympic Games. They start, I think they start in Greece. I'm not sure exactly where it originated. And it's carried around the world. And the light must not be extinguished until it reaches its destination. So it says here, the message of salvation, this wonderful message, <clears throat> and those, the message which I've just read briefly, the light increases, it is to, it, it shines out to all the nations of the earth. It is to go forth as a light that burneth. It will be attended with great power. Until its golden beams have fallen upon every tongue, every people, and every nation upon the face of the whole earth. Let me ask you, now, the Spirit of Prophecy asks, question you and me, my brothers and sisters, in the, as individuals. Let me ask you, what are you doing to prepare for this work? A very serious question. And young people, what are we doing? Yes, and all of us, what are we doing to prepare for this work? But the only way we can do this work if we are what? Have the glory of the Lord, his, his character in our lives. If we are totally separated from the world, totally separate from sin and sinfulness. If we have Jesus in our hearts, as it were. If we have, we have his, live his life, receive his power. Are you building for eternity? You must remember that this angel represents, now listen carefully, this angel represents the people that have this message to give to the world. What is the message? Message of reformation. The message of separation from sin and sinners. The message to have glory of the Lord in our hearts, in our lives. The message to have the character of Christ. The message to get rid of sin, to overcome every sin in our lives. Oh yes. This we must tell the world. A message that Jesus is trying to save us from our sins, not in our sins. A message that we must not be influenced by this, the customs and, and the terrible things that are in the world. This is the message which we have. Sometimes it's not a very pleasant message, my dear brothers and sisters. But this is the message that the Lord wants to give. You must remember that this angel represents the people that have this message to give to the world. Are you among that people? Are we among those people? Do you really believe that this work in which we are engaged is truly the third angel's message? If so, then you understand that we have a mighty work to do and that we ought to be about it. Oh yes, we have a mighty work to do. 
we must not have narrow plans and narrow ideas brothers and sisters once we experience the power of God in our hearts in our lives it cannot you cannot keep it quiet is it? you proclaim it to everyone you have your burst of joy you go and tell the world tell everyone so if so then you understand that we have a mighty work to do and that we ought to do about it we must sanctify ourselves by a strict obedience to the truth placing ourselves in the in right relationship to God and his work so my dear brothers and sisters of course this Thoughts which I brought out here, the signs of Christ coming, call for separation, for reformation, for individual, uh, for conversion, saving of souls. We could spend probably days on each, on each of these subtitles. But in this brief hour, I pray to the Lord that we will be the people whom the Lord will use to proclaim this wonderful message to the world. But first, ourselves have to have right relationship with Jesus. To accepting Christ in our lives is a general term, or general, general term, but what it means to accept Christ in our lives means that our characters and our lives be Christ-like. This is the Bible goal, nothing less, my dear brothers and sisters. And so the Lord gave us a great commission. He says, Go ye in all the world. Go ye and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded to you. So we are to teach the message of Jesus to the world. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. God has given every man a task, a work to do in connection with his kingdom. Everyone who accepts Jesus... Everyone who is Christ-like in his life and in his character he has a work to do. Not only ministers, my dear brothers and sisters. We often think, oh, well, ministers have to do it. We, sometimes even we hear people saying, well, they are paid, they can do the job. I uh, went to visit a family in Australia. And we had a wonderful time in conversation. Then sister looked at her watch and she said to me, they were lay members. He said to me, excuse me, brother, I have to go now. I have a Bible study. I thought it was wonderful. She had a Bible study with a couple. She studies every week. She's a housewife, a sister without theological education or whatever. But she reads the Word of God. And then she loves to tell these people what she read in the Word of God. So on a weekly basis, she studies with these people, and they are now preparing for baptism. A lay sister. A wonderful thing. So, it, that's why it says here, <clears throat> each one professing the name of Christ. We all profess the name of Christ here. He is to be an interested work, worker, ready to defend the principles of righteousness. Ready to defend, my brothers and sisters. The principles of righteousness. But we can only defend principles of righteousness how? If we have the principles of righteousness in our lives. You cannot defend. You cannot give. Or you cannot do that what you don't have. The work of the gospel is not to depend solely upon the minister. Every soul should take, should take an active part in advancing the cause of God. But instead of this, how many at our large churches come and go like door on its hinges, feeling no responsibility for the progress of the work. My dear brothers and sisters, the Lord calls upon every one of us to be a worker for Him. Whatever Christian has a profession, he, uh, what, he has a work to do for the Lord in representing Christ to the world. So in our lives, my brothers and sisters, we are to represent Christ to the world. Wherever we, whether we travel, whether we work, whether we walk the streets, whether we go shopping, whatever we do, we are to represent Jesus. Whatever might be our occupation, we are to be missionaries. Having 
for our chief aim, the winning of souls to Christ. So what is our chief aim? Same aim that Jesus had. Winning of souls to Christ. I remember I had to pay, um, uh, I think it was an electricity bill for the church. And there was a reform movement. <laughs> And the man who was taking the money there at the counter, he said, Oh, reform movement. He said, Whom are you reforming? <laughs> I said, By the grace of God, people. And he said, You have a very big task. He told me, You have a very big task. But yes, that humanly speaking, yes, probably an impossible task. By the grace of the Lord, yes. But it is possible because it's not us, it's God who does that, it's Christ who does that. But we are instruments in God's hands to tell it, to bring that message to the world. So our chief aim is winning souls to Christ. If this is not our interest, we rob God of influence, of time, of money and effort. In withholding our heart service from the Lord, we fail to benefit our fellow men. And thus rob God of the glory that would flow to him through the conversion of others. My prayer is, my dear brothers and sisters, that all who are here will be partakers in this God-given work to those the followers of His, those who proclaim the name of Jesus, who those who accept Christ as their personal Savior. The Lord will use us in this mighty work. And this work, I believe, my dear brothers and sisters, will go, as we are told here in Spirit of Prophecy, as fire that burneth. Nothing but nothing will stop this message, brothers and sisters. No earthly powers will stop this message. If you study the history of God's people in the past, there were many who have tried this. None of them succeeded. And the Lord will do His work through His people if we, if we ourselves as individuals fail to participate, the Lord will have. Because the word of God, the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that but the Lord will have the people who will bear the ark. They will bear the ark. They will finish the work. May the Lord help us that we who are here in this room and thousands of others around the world will proclaim this message of salvation. And uh, then Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. And what shall that happen? In the end. The end will come. Exactly, my dear brothers and sisters. And we want Jesus to come, don't we? Who wants Jesus to come? All of us. Yes, we all want Jesus to come. So let us arise and shine and proclaim this.